So our next panelist today is uh, Mr. Ali Wine. He's an associate of Harvard University's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs and a contributing analyst at Wikistrat. In 2011, he, he delivered the welcome address at the 40 41st St. Gallen Symposium, and in 2012, Young Professionals in Foreign Policy and the Diplomatic Career selected him as one of the 99 most influential foreign policy professionals under 33. He is the co-author, along with Graham Allison and Robert Blackwell, of a new book, Li Kuan Yu, The Grand Master's Insights on China, the United States, and the World. Can everybody, oh, let me see. Can everybody hear me? Good, okay. Uh, well, Griswick, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you and a pleasure to be in the middle of such, uh, such esteemed company. I thought that I would offer some, some thoughts on the big picture of, of U.S.-China relations. And since the focus of this symposium is trust, to begin with a simple proposition, which is that we really shouldn't be surprised that there is mistrust between the U.S. and China. We might lament the existence of that mistrust. We might wish that it wasn't as intense as it is. But mistrust is, in some sense, inbuilt into the interactions between rising powers and leading powers. Uh, a rising power mistrusts the leading power because the leading power stands in its way. And the leading power mistrusts the rising power because, of course, the rising power threatens its the status quo. It threatens its position being number one. So we shouldn't be surprised that there's mistrust between the US and China. And I don't, and I don't think the mistrust is, is unique to the US-China relationship. I think the question we should be asking, though, is not whether or, or why mistrust exists, but why it's so intense. And I, I would offer a few thoughts from both the American perspective and the Chinese perspective. From the American perspective, there are questions about China's long-term intentions. And this was a point that was brought up uh, on many occasions uh, yesterday. Uh, China has uh, accrued an inordinate amount of power and influence just in the preceding decade, and there are questions in the American policy establishment. Will, how will China use this uh, newly acquired power and influence? Will it be content to just continue rising within uh, the framework uh, that the United States has largely underpinned, uh, the post-war framework that the United States has largely underpinned uh, for the better part of the past se uh, seven decades? Will China seek to, seek to achieve strategic parity with the United States? Or in the, in the more extreme case, will China, uh, will China attempt to displace the United States as the world's preeminent power? The question is, we don't know, uh, we meaning Americans. And frankly, I would even argue that in the Chinese establishment, I think that if you were to ask Xi Jinping and his, his top officials, what is your long-term objective, it's not even clear to me that they would have a coherent answer. Um, so that's one, one source of mistrust from uh, the US perspective. Uh, there's also a growing concern among American officials that China seeks to uh, gradually displace, if not exclude, the United States from the Asia Pacific. And the Asia Pacific, of course, is increasingly the nerve center not only of global economics, but also of global strategy and of global geopolitics. And so to be excluded from that region would compromise, uh, over time, it would compromise vital US national interests. So that's a source of concern. But I, I want to present a third reason why I think that there is uh, considerable US mistrust of China. And it has to do not so much with the fact of China's rise, or as many Chinese would say, the return of China. And that's an important distinction. Uh, many Chinese see their, their country as returning, having been the largest economy for 18 of the first 20 centuries of recorded history. They, many see themselves as a returning power. But whether we talk about China's rise or China's return, uh, it's not so much the fact that China is rising. There are many other powers that are rising. Brazil is rising. Uh, India is rising, there are many, Mexico is rising, there are many other countries that are rising. But no country has ever risen as rapidly among, along as many dimensions of power in such a short window of time as China has. And just to give you a, just to give you a sense, just consider w of how dramatic this rise has been or this return. Look at where China was 50 years ago. So 50 years ago, that puts us at 1963. What was going on in China? Uh, China was emerging from the worst famine in human history. It's estimated to have killed some 36 million people. Uh, that ended, that was from 1958 to 1961 or 1962. Five years later, uh, China embarks on the Cultural Revolution that plunges China into chaos for another decade. You then have the events of Tiananmen Square in 1989, which make China an international pariah. And even at the turn of the century, and, and I'm curious what, what my other panelists think about this proposition, but I would argue that even at the turn of the century, China didn't really figure that prominently into the prevailing assessment of the global balance of power. I think that the prevailing assessment of the global balance of power at the turn of the century was a trilateral one, and it focused on the roles of America, Western Europe, and Japan. Uh, and so where is China today? So I, I give you sort of a timeline of where China was, and even the fact that 10 years ago it wasn't really figuring much in the, uh, the prevailing assessment of the global balance of power. 
Today, uh, sitting here in 2013, early 2013, China is confidently on track to overtake the United States as not only the world's largest uh, economy within the next 15 to 20 years, but also a little bit further along as the world's largest defense spender. Now, for the United States, uh, this is obviously, these trends or these, or these projections are a source of great unease. The United States has been the world's largest economy since about the 1880s or 1890s, so roughly a century and a quarter. And it's been the world's largest defense spender for 70 years. And so the United States is accustomed to being number one, however you define the term, whether it's militarily, economically. And to be overtaken by a country, namely China, that has long been regarded in the West and the United States as feeble, corrupt, backward, to be overtaken by such a country is a source of great alarm and, and great unease for many policymakers. Now, from the Chinese perspective, why is there mistrust of the United States? Well, as I just mentioned, uh, th from the Chinese perspective, America is accustomed to being number one. Uh, many, uh, many would argue that being number one is almost a birthright. It's just the natural state of affairs. And so it believes that its values are exceptional, if not universal, and perhaps most importantly, from the Chinese perspective, America doesn't really have much experience, much substantive experience anchoring an international system in partnership with a country that approximates a peer competitor. Now, America has had an experience with a roughly bipolar system, but keep in mind that one experience, which was with the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union was not meant to be engaged. The Soviet Union was not meant to be cooperated with. The Soviet Union was meant to be contained and ultimately defeated. Uh, China, obviously, is not the Soviet Union. We have to cooperate with China. We have to engage China. And it's very difficult to think of an issue, whether it's uh, stabilizing the global economy, making progress on climate change, uh, establishing rules of the road for cyberspace, it's virtually impossible to think of a major issue of, of consequence for the international system uh, that can be, for which we can make meaningful progress without uh, U.S.-China cooperation. So those are some of the reasons for mistrust. And I, I would commend to you a, a monograph that was published, uh, I believe it was last May. Uh, it was a monograph called Addressing Strategic Distrust. It was published by the Brookings Institution. And uh, the first half of it was published by a... Uh, a Chinese uh, a scholar of international relations, uh, Wang Jisi, who is regarded as the preeminent America watcher in China. So he wrote the first section about why the Chinese policy establishment is increasingly suspicious of the United States. And then the second half uh, was written by his American counterpart, Kenneth Lieberthal, who is widely regarded as a foremost China watcher in the United States. And he explained why the American policy establishment was uh, increasingly suspicious of China. So I, I would commend that monograph to you for a very good explanation of why there's growing mistrust. But having said all of that, uh, I, I want to hasten to note that the United States and China are not adversaries. And I say so at two levels. I say so at a policy level. Uh, at the policy level, it's self-evident that the United States and China simply cannot afford to develop an adversaries. And I think that that's a proposition that I, I suspect all of us in this room would agree with. And, and most, I think the most individuals who, who follow the news, who follow international affairs would agree with that proposition. These are the two world's largest economies. They're the, two, uh, uh, the world's two largest defense spenders. It would be catastrophic for international order, for global peace, stability, prosperity, and so forth, if the two were to emerge into enemies. So that's a, that's a policy point. But there's also an analytical point. And the analytical point is that I don't even think it's accurate for the United States and China to characterize each other's adversaries. Recall the, the characteristics of an adversary. An adversary has to demonstrate hostility towards one. An adversary has to possess some kind of capacity, material, physical, technological, to act upon that hostility. And most importantly, an adversary, as a matter of policy, as a deliberate matter of policy, has to attempt to undermine one's vital national interest. I don't think that China, I think that the Chinese leadership, not only the current Chinese leadership, but I suspect that the Chinese leadership for the next 20, 30, 40 years is going to be so preoccupied with addressing internal challenges and fulfilling domestic imperatives that I don't think it's going to have too much time to converge on a coherent policy towards the United States, let alone proceed on the assumption that the U.S. is an enemy. And uh, especially over the course of the past decade, an enormous gap has opened up between the power and the influence that China has accrued and the sophistication of its foreign policy. And so there was a recent op-ed in the New York Times, which I thought put the point well, so I'll just read it to you. Uh, the op-ed said, Chinese leaders are largely nervous and insecure. They are uncertain of how to manage both at home and abroad the inevitable tensions that arise from their nation's rapid ascent onto the world stage. Beijing is not prepared to take on the bigger role that other countries expect it to play, and Beijing still needs time to adjust to its new status as a world power and absorb the radical economic, social, and cultural transformation it has experienced in recent decades. So where, from the American perspective, we look at China's GDP, how it skyrocketed over the past decade, its military spending has skyrocketed, and 
we feel a growing sense of alarm. From the Chinese perspective, I suspect if you were to go to, to Xi Jinping or his top deputies and ask them, their concern is, my gosh, what do we do with all this power and this influence that we've accumulated? It's kind of, uh, it's like when a, it's when a very uh, poor country, for example, absorbs an enormous amount of international aid and doesn't really know what to do with it. Look at what actually happened. You mentioned Afghanistan. Afgan Afghanistan, a very, very poor economy, has absorbed a tremendous amount of international aid over the past decade and hasn't really been able to disperse it properly or handle it properly. So I think that the Chinese leadership is still figuring out what to do with this enormous power and influence. A third point is that America's comprehensive national power, and when I say comprehensive, it includes military power, economic power, soft power, and, and other dimensions of power. Despite America's relative decline, America's comprehensive national power sitting here today still vastly, vastly dwarfs that of China. And so I think that China would be misguided, foolish actually, in the extreme to countenance a confrontation with the US that, all, that it would almost assuredly lose if it were to engage in it. And the fourth point, which is one that isn't often, I think, appreciated in the discourse, either in, in the United States or in China, is that it would be difficult for China to characterize the United States as an adversary, considering that it's the United States, arguably more than any other country, that has facilitated China's rise. If you look at the sources of China's rise, not only over the past, so take a look at the past decade. Uh, China's integration into the participation in the World Trade Organization has been immensely important in terms of facilitating its uh, trade, uh, opening up its markets to uh, consumers the world over. And more generally, going back several decades, one of the major undertakings of American foreign policy was to establish an operating system, if you will, certain rules of the road uh, for the Asia-Pacific region, uh, freeing commerce, uh, safeguarding the maritime commons, safeguarding the global commons in the Asia-Pacific region, and that American effort has been enormously important for China's development. So it would be misguided for China to characterize the United States as an adversary. And, and, and given those points, I mean, I would argue that the United States and China are still figuring each other out. They don't really, so if, if you think of a spectrum between ally and adversary, clearly the United States and China are not allies in the traditional sense. They're not allies in the way that, say, the United States and France are, or the United States and, and Britain are. But at the other end of the spectrum, as I've suggested, they're not adversaries. Uh, if you talk about strategic competition or rivalry between China and the United States, you also have to take into account the fact that economically, they're extremely interdependent. So, it's di so how do you have an adversary, a purely adversarial relationship with a country with whose economy you're so tightly integrated? Uh, similarly, when people talk about the gap between a Chinese core diplomatic principles and values and those of the United States, it's certainly true, but on the flip side, as I mentioned earlier, there's no issue of international consequence that can be addressed unless the United States and China cooperate. And there's a recognition in the leadership of both countries that that cooperation is of utmost importance. So yes, there's rivalry. Yes, they are competitors by default. But to characterize them as adversaries not only ignores their interdependence, but ignores the imperative that they both recognize that they have to cooperate. Uh, and also, I would say that it's true, and this is a, this is a point that was brought up many times yesterday, and, 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 and rightly so, it is true that the U.S.-China relationship is the world's most important bilateral relationship, but I would argue that we, we state or we articulate that proposition so often and affirm that proposition so often that we've kind of become desensitized to how new that consensus and how, kind of how radical that consensus is in some ways. Uh, and again, at the turn of the century, uh, people didn't talk about the importance of the U.S.-China relationship that much. I mean, if you had asked so in, 2000, in 2000, a newly elected Bush administration, if you had asked the Bush administration and if you had asked the, his counterparts in China, what will be the world's singular most important relationship in 10 years? I doubt that either of them would have said the U.S.-China relationship. Maybe they would have said the U.S.-U.K. relationship, maybe the U.S. and Japan, but the U.S.-China relationship I don't think would have been top on the list. And here we are uh, 10 years later and everyone is imposing great demands on this relationship. The U.S. and China, you have to cooperate, you have to cooperate. The U.S. and China are natural allies. They wouldn't have predicted that they would have been thrust into this relationship. So they're still adjusting to one another. And given how different their histories are, given how different their understandings of history are, their core diplomatic principles, their values, and you could enumerate one fundamental difference after another, it's going to take time for the two countries to adjust to one another. And I think that we need to be patient. Uh, it's going to take them a long time to adjust to one another. And I would argue it's also going to take them a long time to adjust to the demands that have been thrust on their relationship. Uh, there was a proposition a, a few years ago which is still kind of floated around this idea of a G2. Uh, the G20 is too unwieldy, it's too inefficient. We need a G2 between the U.S. and China. And both the U.S. and China said, oh, no, we're uncomfortable with that arrangement. Uh, the U.S. didn't like that arrangement because it conferred upon uh, a China a parity that, uh, it essentially implied that the U.S. and China had achieved strategic parity and the U.S. was uncomfortable with that. 
And for China, China felt uncomfortable with the idea of a G2 arrangement because China wasn't prepared to, and still isn't prepared to undertake the global responsibilities that would be commensurate with that status. Uh, so two more points, and then, and then I'll stop. Um, I would argue that in, in appraising, going forward, uh, in appraising whether China is an adversary, and, and I would argue that it isn't now, and it, it, doesn't, it certainly doesn't have to become one, but in assessing the rise of China or, or the return of China, what kinds of questions would American policymakers be asking? And I, I think that there are two key analytical questions that, that we should keep in mind, and I, I would be curious to know what my other panelists think. The first analytical question is, which disagreements between the United States and China result from intrinsic clashes between the two countries' vital national interests and strategic imperatives, and which disagreements result from deliberate Chinese attempts to undermine vital US national interests? Uh, there are going to be certain intrinsic clashes. And when a clash is intrinsic, again, you might lament it, but you can't really say it's because China's an adversary. If we discern a deliberate Chinese attempt to undermine what China and the United States both regard as core vital American interests, then that's a discussion we can have. The second question, which is arguably, arguably not only harder, but also more important, is which policies of China are comparable to those that any rising power or returning power in its place would take to safeguard an expanding set of interests? Is it, you know, is it surprising that China is increasing its military spending? Well, no. Uh, China has, as its economy grows and as its newly empowered middle class demands that that rate of growth be sustained, China has this going out strategy. It has to traverse the entire world very aggressively in search of raw materials, commodities, energy, and so forth. So uh, it makes sense that China is, as China's economic interests become more global, it makes sense that its military spending is increasing. But can we distinguish between actions on the one hand that any power in China's situation or circumstances would take versus actions or policies that China would be undertaking as part of a deliberate strategy to exclude the United States from the Asia Pacific and in time the world? So I, I would submit those two questions for your consideration and end on, um, end on a note about the language that we use. I've, I've, I've echoed this point about the folly of using terms such as adversary, enemy, antagonist, and so forth. Language matters. Words matter. Rhetoric matters. And the language that we use, and I say we to refer to policymakers in the United States, journalists, academics, uh, citizens, and also attendees at, at symposia such as, such as this wonderful symposium that's taking place at Tufts right now, the language that we use matters, and it shapes not only, of course, how Americans interpret and understand Chinese conduct, but also on the flip side, how the Chinese uh, people understand and interpret American conduct. And I think that we ought to be careful about the language we use. While we don't know what the U.S.-China relationship will look like perhaps 10 or 20 years from now, one proposition seems clear. China is far likelier to actually evolve into an adversary if the United States declares it to be one. And so I'll, I think I'll stop there. I probably have already run over my time, but thanks for your time. Um, 